It's now my privilege to introduce our commencement speaker today, briefly because he doesn't really need an introduction. Many of today's graduates came to know Governor Howard Dean during his presidential campaign in 2004. In fact, some of our graduates worked on his campaign. Governor Dean graduated from Yale University in 1971 with a degree in political science. He received a medical degree from Albert Einstein College of Medicine in 1978 and began his career as a medical practitioner in Vermont. In 1980, Dr. Dean spearheaded a grassroots campaign to stop a condominium development on Lake Champlain, favoring construction of a bicycle trail instead. The effort succeeded and it was the beginning of his political life in Vermont. By 1991, Dr. Dean had become governor of Vermont and served five two-year terms in that office. Governor Dean was faced with an economic recession and budget deficit. During his tenure as governor, the state paid off much of its debt, balanced its budget 11 times, raised its bond rating, and lowered income taxes twice. You are sure you're a Democrat, right? <laughs> He also expanded the Dr. Dinosaur program, which ensures universal health care for children and pregnant women in Vermont. As a presidential candidate, Governor Dean pioneered the use of the internet to collect campaign contributions. As we know today, using the internet to raise campaign contributions is indispensable. As chairman of the Democratic National Committee beginning in 2005, Governor Dean created and employed the 50-state strategy, which was devised to make Democrats competitive in states that had often been dismissed as unwinnable. That strategy was successful not just in the 2006 midterm elections, but also in the 2008 presidential election. When Governor Dean resigned from the DNC this year, he was named its chairman emeritus. Governor Dean began his political career with a grassroots campaign, emphasized grassroots involvement throughout his career, and has had a lasting impact on the way presidential campaigns are run. We are honored to have him here with us today. Please join me in welcoming Governor Howard Dean. Thank you. Dean O'Rourke, thank you very much, and thank all of you. Um, I can truly say this is the first and only time I've ever enjoyed being in a Gannis Arena. Uh, the inside joke is I'm from the University of Vermont, and we were the only team in America to beat the NCAA champion uh, BU uh, team, hockey team, twice this year, even though we didn't beat, beat them when, they really, when it really counted. So I had to at least get that in before I got serious. Let me... Um, you know, it's customary for the graduation speaker to talk about the future and, and the important things that you're all going to do, and I'm actually going to do just a little bit of that. I want to tell you something about yourselves, statistically, because you're, on average, probably 24, 25, 26 years old. You've already had the most important election in your lifetime. You, starting with a huge grassroots uprising, in early 2003, we're responsible for electing Barack Obama President of the United States. Your generation is the first multicultural generation in the history of America. Now, America has been a multicultural country for a long time, but you are the first generation that sees yourself as you really are. And so the very first thing you do before you're out of your 20s is to elect a multicultural president. It is extraordinary. This is the transfer of power to a new generation of Americans, and you are that generation. But this did not start in 2007 or 8. In 2004, people under the age of 30 increased their voting participation by 20 percent, and 56 percent of them voted for John Kerry for president. It's the only age group he carried. In 2006, People your age increased their voting participation by 24 percent over the previous off-year election in 2002, and 61 percent of you voted for the Democratic candidate for Congress. And in 2008, for the first time in my lifetime, and this is an earthquake for everybody in my generation and in the last two or three generations in politics, more people voted in the presidential election who are under the age of 35 years old than voted in the presidential election who are over the age of 65 years old. That has never happened before in my lifetime. And what it means is this really is your president. Barack Obama is your president, and you elected him, and you slept on floors all over the country and knocked on doors over the, all over the country to do it. 
But there are some other things about your generation that are signified by this torch passing. When I had my last presidential primary in Wisconsin, I came home and sort of started to unwind from it. And my kids came up to me one time after we were in, having one of these discussions, and they looked at me and they said, well, Dad, you're just too confrontational. And you have to be a parent to know how, what an indignity it is to have your teenage kids come up and tell you you're too confrontational. But I thought about it for a while, and I realized that it was true. My generation is a confrontational generation. I don't apologize for very many things that we did. We were, the, we were transformed by the presidency of John F. Kennedy. And we were an activist generation. And we had much to be active about. Civil rights, voting rights, women's rights, gay rights, all these things, the end of the Vietnam War. And we accomplished a lot of things, and we failed in some of the things. But it was an activist, confrontational generation. We could put a million people on the streets in Washington, D.C., but your generation sends a million emails to Congress and shuts down the congressional email system for three days. You are smarter and more pragmatic. And the message that we get in my generation from your generation and the message of President Obama was, from you to us, will you stop fighting about the things that you've been fighting over for 30 years without result and get something done about the things that really matter? That is the cause of your generation. Your generation is solidly center left, but unlike my generation, you have a much narrower bandwidth. You don't have pe very many people on the far right or on the far left as my generation did. You are pragmatic people and you believe in talking to each other. We did a lot of polling when I was at the DNC. One of the most astonishing results was this. We reached out to evangelical Christians because we were tired of being de demonized and we didn't think we were suddenly going to get all the evangelical vote, but we thought that we could let them see us in a different light as human beings. So we polled among evangelicals under 35 years old. You know what the three top priorities are for evangelical Christians who are less than 35 years old? Number one is poverty. Number two is climate change. And number three is Darfur. And we looked at that and said, this is a list of democratic issues. Why can't we work together with people? We are going to disagree with them on some issues, but can't we work together with folks on stuff that we really care about that we have in common? And that is the hallmark of your generation. It's to set aside the things that we are going to fight over and focus on the things we agree on. This is an extraordinary generation. And now comes the part of every graduation speech where I have to do the responsibility thing. Of all the mistakes that my generation made, the biggest was that after we had succeeded in getting human rights to the forefront and reorienting our, reorienting our foreign policy, we thought we could take some time off. And we thought we deserved some time off. And we took time to, for our careers and our families. And there is no, nothing that is more important than family. It was a mistake. It was a mistake that led, in my view, ultimately to a presidency where the Constitution was no longer respected the way it should have been. That won't happen if you learn from our mistakes. You can never set politics aside. And I don't mean you have to go and knock on doors and sleep on floors and all those things that you can do in your 20s and you're a student. But we need you to always be involved in your community. Politics is not running for Congress and running for office. That's some of it. It's also community organizing. It's being on your community library board to make sure that folks have a chance to read. It's, being, it's working in your church, your synagogue, or your mosque to find ways to make less fortunate people have a chance. It is being on the planning commission. It's anything that organizes human beings. Re Politics is simply resource allocation in a democracy and organization to get things done. We need you to be involved. Because this nation really is a great nation, and we are unique, there is no American who is better because they're an American as opposed to an Asian or a European or an African. 
but America is a great society because in our founding documents there is a sense of optimism and a rejection of cynicism that doesn't exist in many other parts around the world. It is not an accident that the vast majority of people in this hall are descendant of people who came here to try to build a better life. This is an extraordinary country, but democracy is like every other invention of human beings. If you don't nurture it, it dies. Our generation almost let that happen. Your generation must not. You have an extraordinary achievement before you're out of your 20s. You have changed the culture of America to look like America really is. You have elected a president who represents, because of who he is, the vast majority of people in this country have been disenfranchised for generation after generation. This is your president. This extraordinary achievement is about your country and the renewal of our, of our, renewal of our great nation. He is your president. You have elected him. You have changed America. Don't blow it.